Now as a general rule, I don't work with highly figured woods. And I've never been commissioned to build a piece using highly figured material, nor would I typically take one on. But this one, this one's different. It's not just a random piece of furniture someone hired me to build. It's my most important piece to date, which also turned out to be one of my most challenging and frustrating mistakes. Those are in the wrong spot. New techniques and a finish that had me going to plan E, which is almost an F. Luckily, Jerry and Lola are always there to put things in perspective. Now, the first order of business was to go shopping and pick up some tiger maple. The fine folks down at Groff and Groff in Quarryville, PA, invited me down to check out their operation and were very gracious in donating the material for this project. It was quite a sight to behold walking out into the warehouse and the incredible organization on display. They have a huge selection of domestic lumber as well as imports and exotics and live edge slabs. Now, to be honest, I didn't really know what I was looking for. I've never worked with curly maple before. I just figured I'd find pieces with the most curl and figure, and that would produce the best looking piece of furniture. So once I had picked out about 50 board feet of lumber, I loaded up and headed back to the shop to get to work. Now the client for this project is not Lola, but a very dear friend of mine that I've known since we were kids in middle school. She had grown up sleeping in an antique bed made of tiger maple that had been in her family since the 1800s. There was also many other tiger maple pieces in her house growing up, so that style has a lot of sentimental value and brings great comfort to her. Now she had sent some inspiration reference photos, but with the style direction of mid-century modern antique eclectic vintage. Uh, what? So we came up with this design that has one flat panel door and three drawers below. And not only will it have a unique look, as you saw from that photo, it will sit on top of a bathroom vanity between two sinks. Now the other request for this cabinet was a sneaky door on each side of the cabinet. Hmm. What's a sneaky door? Now I don't typically work with figured woods, so this is a bit of a challenge for me. When gluing up the panels for the sides of this cabinet, I want the grain to look consistent, but inevitably you're going to see a noticeable glue line board to board since each one is a little bit different. Now as you can see from the graphic on screen, I need to cut a door in the side of each of these panels. Now to do that, I'm gonna glue up multiple strips together and have that glue line right on the edge of the door opening. I was very careful with my layout and marking on these panels because I wanted to make sure after I ripped all the parts down on the table saw that everything went back together the way it was. Before glue up, I could get all of these parts milled down. I had to play the away game down at my buddy Tim's shop to use his jointer to get one flat face and one square edge. Then it was back to my shop to run everything through the planer to get down to a final thickness of three quarters of an inch. And even though I have a helical head on my planer, I still had to run very light passes to make sure I didn't get any tear out in that curly maple. And it was all about the glue ups. I started first with the top of the cabinet and then the adjustable shelf, and then moved on to the fixed shelf, which will sit above the bank of three drawers. Okay, here are four pieces for one of the sides of our cabinet. So first step is to glue these two pieces together. Then we'll chop the door out here and then glue these outer pieces to the center. I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm just running a cat lounge out here. Now with the glue pretty well set up on these panels, I could take them out of the clamps and cut out the sneaky doors. Now I'm using the little trim table saw because it has a very thin kerf blade on it, which allows me to lose as little material as possible between the door and the panel, ensuring grain continuity. Now I really can't afford any glue squeeze out on the end grain of that middle section. So with a little green tape, that helps give me a line of demarcation of where to place my glue. After those were sufficiently cured in the clamps, I could rip those panels to width on the table saw. And since there were little imperfections in the faces, I could then run it through the drum sander to get everything nice and flat. And with the table saw all warmed up, I could cut my fixed shelf and the top of my cabinet to correct width in preparation for another glue up. All right, well, I've encountered my first mistake. Well, more of an oversight. These access panel doors are going to be installed using these sauce hinges. 
which need to be recessed in the door as well as into the frame. Now, if you watched my video way back that I did on my cat door, I waited to glue this up and put the recesses in and then glued it up. Trying to get the recesses or mortises in here now, that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. Now, in many of my YouTube build videos, it may seem like I have everything under control and that working with power tools and hand tools and building furniture is such a wonderful way to make a living, which it is. However, there's also a whole other side to it that often goes unseen, a side that's filled with stress and pressure. Now, the majority of my projects are commissions, just like this one, which means the stakes are much higher than when building something for myself. Mistakes in this line of work come with a hefty price tag, whether it's in materials, time, or usually both. Now the client for this cabinet project, as I mentioned earlier, is a wonderful friend of mine that I've known since we were kids. What I didn't tell you is she's been through an incredible life-changing journey, undergoing a double mastectomy after a breast cancer diagnosis at the age of 45. And despite her miraculous recovery, she continues to grapple with the physical aftermath and equally as challenging is the mental health aspect of facing your own mortality and the anxiety of not knowing if the cancer might return. Now, mental health isn't something a lot of us think of, but getting help isn't as difficult as you might think, thanks to the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. Now, BetterHelp can match you to over 30,000 therapists in their network, which gives you access to a wider range of expertise than may be available in your area. And with BetterHelp, you can have therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging, whatever is the most comfortable for you. And if you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash Keith Johnson. To get started, you'll fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you'll get matched with your therapist, in most cases within 48 hours or less. And you can schedule the therapy sessions at a convenient time that fits your busy schedule. So if you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash Keith Johnson. Clicking that link not only supports this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. That way you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Now, some people argue that the domino is a point and shoot tool and there's really no learning curve and what could possibly go wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you, if your layout isn't correct, if your settings aren't correct, you could easily run into problems. I've been using this tool for seven or eight years and I still make mistakes. Hmm. Any guesses on what I did here? All right, now I've officially made my first mistake. When I had the domino upside down like this and I had flipped the fence back and forth, it wasn't fully seated at 90 degrees. So you can see, thank you, Jerry, that these are not perpendicular. So what I did was I glued in dominoes. Now one mistake that a lot of people make is they'll let these sit in here for a half hour, cut them and replunge their holes, but that glue in there isn't dry and you'll end up with a mushy mess. Jerry, come on, man. You'll end up with a mushy mess inside that mortise and then you'll plunge the new one and it'll just be a disaster in there. So let it dry. And I quickly followed up that mistake with the domino with another one. Now the stretchers for the drawers needed to be four and a half inches apart. So I took a four inch spacer and a half inch spacer and then set my little guide jig that I made, made my plunges and those are in the wrong spot. It's right there. You see what I neglected to do was actually put in one of the stretchers as a spacer and then clamp the jig and then plunge. So luckily those mortises were in a place that I could fill and they would be covered by the drawer slides. So no big deal. Crisis easily averted. Now to make all the mortises in the ends of my rails, I'm just using the domino dock here to vertically stand up the domino. That is made by Ramon Valdez, by the way. Now this is one of my favorite parts of any build. It's the first dry assembly. I've spent all this time with the design work and then the material processing and the layout and the joinery and now I get to see this thing in the flesh at full scale and see if I screwed up any proportions or dimensions. All right, what do you guys think? Thank you. That's very sweet. 
Now for the drawer boxes on these, I'm just going with clear maple. It has a little figure in it, but it's not going to be stained to match the rest of the piece. That would just be a little too overpowering. All right, drawer parts. Three backs, three fronts, six sides, and then three of our main drawer fronts. Now the joinery for these drawer boxes are going to be rabbits in the front and a butt joint in the back. But you know me, I can't just leave it that simple, so I am going to fancy it up a bit. Oh, and here comes Lola being all sneaky. And once those rabbits were cut, then I could cut the grooves for the bottom of the drawers. Now I'm going to be using undermount slides, so the start of that groove needs to be one half of an inch from the bottom of the drawer boxes. And three drawers means three drawer bottoms. Oh boy, now it was veneer time. Now this veneer is going to be used for the back panel of the cabinet as well as for the panel in the front door. Now I picked this up from veneersupplies.com. I bought four pieces that were 11 inches by about seven feet long and they were about 32 bucks a piece. So roughly 130 bucks for four pieces of veneer that are in sequence. Now this is not paperback veneer. In retrospect, I wish I had been able to buy paperback, which when I get to the finishing process, I'll show you why. Now I don't work with high-end veneer or really veneer that much at all, so this was a good learning experience for me. It's definitely key to get a nice, clean, straight edge where those two pieces of veneer are going to be joined. And then just using some tape, I pull that nice and tight. And then this is the glue that veneersupplies.com recommends. And they also recommend a specific type of glue roller that they sell. That way you get a nice, even film thickness across your sheets. It is made of a medium density foam rubber and it can be reused as long as you don't use it with solvent based adhesives. And to make it easier to slide into the vac bag, I like to put a little tape on the edges to keep those down. And then it was into the vac bag. And with that specific adhesive, it recommends 60 to 80 minutes under pressure. So after about an hour and a half, I pull it out, give it a quick once over and looks pretty good to me. Then it was the same process for the door panel. As you can see, I use a little shrink wrap to wrap all around the edges. That way, if I have any glue squeeze out, it doesn't get all over my vac bag or the platen underneath. Hey, Lola, keep an eye on that for me. All right, I haven't talked about this detail yet, but since this cabinet is sitting on top of a vanity, it needs to be pushed flush up against the wall. Unfortunately, you can see there's a backsplash there. So I'm going to have to scribe it, basically cut a notch here. But what that means is the back panel needs to be recessed in further than the depth of the backsplash. So I'm going to have to dado out a groove here, which will push that cabinet back in further. I'm going to cut a groove in the cabinet top so that that back panel can slide in. But because that cabinet looks so nice dry assembled, I wasn't quite ready to break it down yet. So I started sanding drawer parts instead. Can you believe that? I would rather sand than disassemble the cabinet. What kind of bizarro world is this? Now, I wish I had some good advice on how to glue up rabbited drawers for you guys, but I don't. I always fight these with corner squares and a crazy amount of clamps. It's really quite comical. Well, not for me. Maybe it is for you watching. All right, so I did pre-finish the insides of these drawer boxes after I glued these up as well as the drawer bottoms with three coats of a water-based polyurethane. General finishes, high performance. And now we can glue these up. You know, Jerry, they say owners and their pets start to look alike, but I don't know, I don't see it. And now for those little upgrade details I mentioned earlier on the drawer boxes, I'm doing exposed dominoes on the back, which Jerry only semi approved of until I told him, yes, I will be trimming these and sanding them flush. Now for the front of the drawer boxes, I thought it prudent to tie into the brass hardware as well as those brass sauce hinges. So I'm drilling for some brass pins. This is just 3 16ths of an inch brass rod you can buy on Amazon or anywhere online. So once I trim these pretty much to all the same length, I take them over to the drill press where I just use some double-sided tape to stick progressive grits on this block, work my way around, and you get a perfectly shiny brass tip. Now those pins are going to stick a little proud of the surface, so before I put those in, I wanted to cut the notches in the bottom of my drawers to accept the drawer slides, which is where my next mistake happened. Some of you may notice what I did just there. 
Here's me stepping away, having a mini tantrum. But before we assess the damage, let's finish up notching the rest of the drawers and I'm gonna go inside and cry. All right, time to fix that boo-boo. So there's two options. I can either cut in a little patch here, but I would first have to make this a little bit bigger because you can see a lot of tear out here. But you would inevitably see a vertical line there where that glue seam is. So instead, I'm going to rip the top off all the way down on the table saw, and I actually have a piece from that same grain that I'll rip a strip and then glue that on top. Ooh, I just had me a good idea. All right, made a little router template here. This is gonna give me a straight line all the way across the back and then up the two sides here. I'll just have to clean up the corners with a chisel. So it took a couple minutes to make that jig, but it's gonna make a perfectly smooth square surface for that patch to be applied. Then I could just square up the corners using a chisel and get that patch glued up and clamped in there. Let that sit in the clamps pretty much all day. Then I could take it out, sand everything flush, and then take a look at the repair. I'm pretty happy with that. I mean, it's the back of the drawer that's recessed in the shadows. You'll never see it. Now to protect the brass pins from any moisture or turning green, I'm spraying them with a lacquer that is specifically suited for brass. And then I could glue those in with a little bit of CA glue and a lot of hammer. Then I could finally get the undermount drawer slides installed. These are Bloom 563H, 12 inch, and give that soft close mechanism a dry run and see how my fix looks in the back of the drawer. Yeah, we're good. Now for the door frame construction, there are multiple methods you could use. A lot of times I'll use a cope and stick bit on the router. You can just use a tongue and groove on the table saw. I could use the domino, but in this case, I wanted a nice big beefy mortise and tenon so I used the Panto router, which gave me an inch and a half wide by a half inch thick tenon. But there is one challenge associated with this joinery method. It's not cutting in the grooves in the rails because you can run those all the way through. It's cutting the grooves in the styles because they need to stop at the end of the mortise and not be cut all the way through the full length of the style. So to do this, I need to do a plunge cut on the table saw. Now you could do this at the router table. The reason I don't like to do that is because this is curly maple and I would have to do multiple passes that could put a severe beating on that router bit. And there's a much greater potential for tear out because of the curly figure in that maple. Remember a little while back when I chose to sand instead of actually breaking the cabinet down to cut the groove in the back? Well, the time has finally come to cut that groove at the top of the cabinet as well as the rabbit along the sides of the cabinet. Oh, and it also gave me a chance to make another mistake. Yeah, that rabbit really needed to stop and not go all the way through the top. So with a little patch, some glue, a clamp, and another easy repair. And now back to addressing the mortises for the sauce hinges in the frame that I really should have done before I glued this panel up. So I marked them out with the template and then using a drill bit, I hogged out the majority of the material, cleaned everything up with a chisel, and it wasn't as bad as I expected. But then I got to use technology, the Shaper Origin, to cut the mortises in the actual door. I gotta tell you, this was much faster. The only problem with the built-in template file for this hardware with the Shaper Origin is it fits too well and it's difficult to get the hinge out. So if you ever cut these, I suggest adding a .005 offset to it to make it a scotch looser and easier to remove. Ooh, snow, pretty. Now this cabinet doesn't have a lot of room for adjustable shelves, just one. So I'm putting a series of five holes roughly in the middle of the cabinet. Okay, this one's probably going to stir the pot a little bit. I am actually gonna use the Shaper Origin to drill the hole for the push to open mechanism for the small sneaky drawers. I needed to drill a two inch deep hole perfectly straight. So I went as deep as the Shaper could go and finished up with a hand drill. All right, I don't like stains, I don't like dyes, I don't like messing around with any of that which is why I always use Rubio or Osmo just to enhance the natural beauty of the wood, but those aren't going to work on this tiger maple and I really need it to pop. I need that grain to pop. 
So my buddy Paul at Copper Pig Fine Woodworking introduced me to the technique using this Kibbler's Long Rifles Iron Nitrate, spreading it on the wood, letting it dry, and then using a heat gun, creates some sort of reaction which turns the wood the perfect color. And then when you put a couple coats of shellac on top, you get this beautiful figure. But I ran into a problem. The back panel of the cabinet and the panel on the door are veneered onto plywood. And what happened is it got really splotchy, which seems to be because the glue soaked through the veneer more so in some places than others, creating an uneven reaction. Now plan B is using General Finish's dye stains to create the same effect, which I think I have done here. Now in order to get the results shown in the sample, I have to follow a strict sanding schedule for everything. So I'm going to do every part with 120, then water pop it, which raises the grain, then hit it with 150, water pop it again, and then once that dries, 180 by hand. First step is I'm going to mix General Finish's dye stain medium brown in a two to one ratio to water. And you are witnessing this real time, how this is going to look on here. I don't know if it's gonna be splotchy or not. Now this is just a staining pad you could get at any paint supply store or probably a big box store. And you have to be quicker than Lola when she hears the treat jar open to make sure you don't get any lap lines. Now one method people use, like Jeff Jewett, who is a finishing expert, is to put a trace coat of this on, sand it back, put another coat on to really enhance that grain. I tried that and I did not like the look. It left little specks all in the grain. It looked bad. All right, door panel. Looks pretty good. So with all the sanding, water popping, and first layer of dye stain done on the back panel and the door panel, it was time to go on to the rest of the parts. The hand plane did a great job of cleaning up those edges. Then I could water pop everything and hit it with 150. But before I water popped again, I wanted to get everything glued up. Now, as you can see, since I pre-stained the door panel with the first coat of brown, I wanted to do the same thing to the inside edges here. That way I don't have to try to get along those edges and get extra stain on the panel itself. Now I'm just letting that panel float within that groove. It really shouldn't expand and contract much. It's plywood, but if it wants to, it has the freedom to. Then I just glue up the tenons, a little bit in the mortises, a couple clamps, and then we're off to the cabinet glue up. Now to make this easier on myself, I pre-glued in all the dominoes in the sides of the carcass. I also pre-glued in the dominoes at one end of all the other parts. So then all I had to do was spread glue on the mating parts, drop those in, drop the sides on, give it a few 20 wax with the mallet, put on some clamps and just walk away. Now, even with the most thought out plan for a glue up strategy, it's still one of the most stressful parts of a build for me. However, the next day when taking all those clamps off, it's one of my favorite parts of a build because now you've essentially built something, which always gets me re-energized to press on. But before I put any dye stain on, I wanted to work on getting the door and the drawer front size to fit the openings perfectly. Now the door opening wasn't perfectly square, so I essentially have to do a scribe cut. To make these cuts, I'm going to use my L-Fence. This is made by Michael Hale at Tailored Forest. Leave a link down below if you want to check it out. Very versatile tool. So with some double-sided tape, I stick down a straight edge that lines up perfectly with my marks that I need to cut to. Now the outside of the saw blade needs to be in perfect alignment with this edge. Now, could I use the track saw to make these cuts? Yes, but I love using the elf fence. So I'll do the tracks on the bottom of the doors. And now the moment of truth. All right, these are all just a hair under 330 seconds, which is okay with me. And since I love a good jig, it's been a few minutes making this on the table saw to hold up the drawer fronts as I size them. And the process for correctly sizing the drawer fronts was exactly the same as the door, except with these, the openings were perfectly square. So all I needed to do was mark them and then I could rip them on the table saw to the correct width and I did cross cut them to length on the table saw as well. And then I could clean up those pesky saw blade marks with a hand plane. 
Huge shout out to my buddy Eric Curtis, E.N. Curtis. Go check out his YouTube channel. It is fantastic. He helped me get this number four set up with a high angle frog. And with the door all cut to size and fitting in the opening nicely, I could drill for the hinges. So I'm just using this Craig hinge jig, which works great for doing small things like this. Drill out the 35 millimeter cup and then the corresponding holes for the tool free inserta hinge attachment. Now, being that my friend is a cancer survivor, I wanted to add one more small detail, something that was subtle and not in your face, but something that she would see every day and remind her what an incredibly brave and strong person she is. So on the inside bottom of one of the sneaky doors, my buddy Pete at Petrie's Workshop was kind enough to laser engrave this. And then it was on to the process I'd been dreading this whole project, and that was the dye stain. So one part reducer and two parts medium brown. So you basically rub it on to all the parts, wipe off the excess, try not to get any lap marks or finger marks or anything bleeding over and getting any runs. Yeah, it's a real joy. Amen, Lola. All right, maybe I'm being a little too negative. It wasn't that difficult but it also wasn't that much fun and it wasn't that easy knowing that I still had a whole other coat of dye stain to put on top of this isn't that right Jerome all right this is going to be a 50 50 mix of orange and light brown I'm also going to add a little trans tint yellow and I'm going to add some extender to give me a little more open time hopefully it doesn't dry as fast and I don't get as many runs just to show you a quick comparison, here's the first coat of medium brown, and here's with the second coat of orange and light brown and yellow. This process was pretty much the same. Wipe it on and wipe it off. Very reminiscent of the Miyagi Dojo. However, it is important not to apply too much pressure because you can rub off the layer of dye below it. It's a bit of a delicate operation. Now the final top coat I decided to go with on this, and I'll be honest, I regret it, which I'll explain in a moment why, but first, the formulation is by my buddy Eric Curtis, who I mentioned before. It is an equal part mix of Liberon oil, turpentine, and fast drying gloss polyurethane. My original plan was to just have this sprayed with conversion varnish and be done with it. But I figured, hey, why not try out a brand new finish on a custom piece of furniture using a wood that I've never used before and a stain that I've never used before. It's hard to argue with that logic, Actually, no, it's not hard at all. Now, the real reason I didn't like this finish was because it was such a slow build. Now, I know it looks glossy and nice there, but that settles down a lot, as you can see, because I'm applying another coat on top of a previously dried coat, which is very matte. And because it's essentially a film finish that you're building, it's very difficult for me to get an even sheen, not get fingerprints, not get any streaks. There's definitely a learning curve to this finish, and Eric has mastered it. But what I've learned is I never want to do it again sorry eric but thank you for picking up my multiple phone calls and answering my text messages helping out as much as possible you did your best now because this cabinet is sitting directly on a vanity where it could be exposed to water i'm actually going to install some leveling feet so i can get it up off the surface and then the molding will wrap around that way any moisture can run underneath and won't affect the cabinet itself Speaking of molding, I had these custom molder knives made. My buddy Tim down at True Trade Carpentry was kind enough to run it through his molding machine. It took probably 10 passes to get down to the final profile. Those light passes ensured that we didn't get any tear out and I was blown away by how smooth the finish was. And I specifically designed this molding to be a solid crown. That way it just sits flat against the case. And just like everything else, this had to go through the multi-step finish process, two layers of dye stain. Now at this point, I decided to spray everything with a seal coat of shellac. And here's why. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I had to go to plan E for my finish. Now plan A was after all the dye stain was done and it was ready for top coat, it was going to be sprayed with conversion varnish. Super durable, perfect for a bathroom. However, since someone else would have to spray the conversion varnish for me, I really wanted to be in ultimate control of the finish. So plan B was to just shellac everything and be done with it. However, because this cabinet will reside in a bathroom where there's a lot of moisture from the shower, it could potentially blush. So plan C is where I went to Eric Curtis's finish using the oil, poly, and turpentine blend, which actually did look nice when it was fully cured, but I just didn't find it to be durable enough 
for everyday use in a bathroom. Now that is purely my opinion, of which I have no real data to back it up. And that's where plan D entered the fold, which was to completely erase everything that had been done before by sealing it all with shellac and then spraying with lacquer. However, that again puts the control of the finish in someone else's hands. So plan E, which actually has not taken place yet at the timing of this video, will be to spray a water-based conversion varnish on top of the seal coat of shellac. That should do it, I hope. Now, despite this cabinet seeming design simplicity, I mean, three drawers and a door and some moldings, details like this little door stop, as well as the sneaky doors, all add another level of customization and difficulty, which translates into more time. The process just to attach the moldings wasn't as simple as just nailing it to the case like you would crown molding in a bedroom. I didn't want any visible fasteners, so gluing on these little blocks allow the crown to sit while I fasten it from behind. And I use the same process for the base molding. In using these brass sleeves for the pins of the adjustable shelf of how to take an ordinary piece and make it that much more special. And I tried to maintain that detail continuity wherever I could, such as cutting one of the brass pins since they're just brass coated steel and using that for the magnetic magnetic catch on the sneaky doors. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any brass push to open mechanisms. When someone orders a custom piece of furniture for me, my hope is they'll have it forever and possibly pass it down to someone in their family or to someone they know. And because of my friend's emotional and sentimental attachment to Tiger Maple Furniture, I have no doubt it will bring her great joy and function for the rest of her life and hopefully become a family heirloom. And this little detail will be a daily reminder that tells the story of her strength and courage in her battle against cancer. And now for the glamour shots. Unfortunately, there wasn't time to get this piece delivered and installed in its home before this video needed to be released. And I don't think it fully came across on screen, but this project tested me in every way possible over the six weeks it took to build. So a huge thank you to my buddy Paul from Copper Big Fine Woodworking for all the phone calls, advice, and for always pushing me creatively. Thank you so much for watching, and don't be afraid to try something new, whether it be a new technique, working with a new species of wood, or building something for a dear friend. You'll be glad you did. I sure am.